Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvina Vaditamastu Ma Vidvishavahe Om Shanti 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 May we be nurtured together, may we be nourished together, may we strive together, may our learning shine, may we not quarrel. Peace. Uh, we're not going to uh, look at this yet. I'd like to continue from last week. The theme that we're still on is the, uh, the self is not the doer. So we want to first of all address what it means to say self the self is not the door, the eye is not the door, because the, where liberation is, is the recognition and the understanding what it means to say that I am not the door. We're not, of course, saying that the body is not the door, that we have to know. The body is the door. It's, it's the body with your limbs through uh, the uh, organs of action and the, that is your hands and organs of uh, knowledge that are inputting the data and, of course, processing that data in the mind and then uh, correspondingly um, uh, performing actions in the environment that need to be attended to. This is what we call the Swadharma. That is a role that we need to play in order to perform appropriately and timely the uh, expectation or the environment which is asking us to participate. This is exactly what Arjuna's uh, primary uh, issue was, which is actually a universal uh, issue. It is that as long as one remains without knowing what my identity is in this moment, then what happens is there is inherent confusion. Just like if, let's say, you go to a job and you're told to work, but you're not said what to work or you're not given a specific protocol, then what's going to happen? We're going to walk around very confused and ultimately very disempowered. So that was exactly Arjuna's problem on Kurukshetra, whereby he knew what my duty, that is from your standpoint, my duty is. And that is my duty is to, as a soldier, to protect and sustain a sanata dharma or samanya dharma, that is uh, preserve the society from the collapse of himsa or the collapse of a um, certain society that was not having a role model to look onto. So what happened was when Arjuna having his identity, his role absolutely clear what it is on the field, as soon as he saw his two role models, Drona and uh, his uh, other um, teacher, then he instantly lost his identity, his role. That means before the role was clear. It was, I am a soldier and I am here to do my duty. That is, if you're a student, duty is to listen. As a teacher, it's to teach. As a, uh, you know, whatever you work at in the job, that's what your role is. As soon as that role disappears, then what ensues immediately is confusion. We can all relate to this. So that means the, the most important thing is having clear vision what our role is at all time. As soon as there is a forgetting of the role in life, whether it's in family, in job, with friends, with spouse, with children, this happens very, uh, you know, it happens once in a while, where we mix our, uh, we confuse the I with the role. That means we mix the I with the actual role that needs to be attended, performed to the best of your ability, and once it's finished, then we, come back to ourselves, to the I. So that's exactly what I would like to bring um, into this session by uh, starting off with a story of a Greek boy who wished to become prosperous and successful in his uh, trade. And he was living with a, a father who didn't have much money and he was living in a place which didn't consist of many opportunities. So the boy had certain hopes to um, become a successful sea merchant. And he 
requested his father to leave home so he could look overseas and look for an opportunity. And father said gladly, son, I support your every decision. It's your life, which is a good father. That's what a father should recognize that every son, daughter has their own swadharma to fulfill and we need to encourage them to, to fulfill that duty. Before the boy went, the father gave the boy a ring and the ring, it hung on the son's um, neck and the son didn't really take note of it. He just put it around his neck and it was a token of reminder for father's good luck for his son. As the son went overseas, he very quickly became successful and he became a prosperous sea merchant. Uh, in fact, he became so popular that soon enough, the uh, royal Harris, who inherited uh, the palace from her previous uh, father, who was a king, she was uh, to be married with him because he was an ideal uh, match for her. He was successful, he was well known, he was a good man, and she was uh, played an important role in the, in the society. So they were going to be together. So the, the boy, uh, now he's a man of course, uh, he was very happy, he was ecstatic the night before marriage. And someone knocked on the door and said, hey, we have, there's a little problem. Um, we had a high seas, there was a torrential storm, and all of your ships have uh, been destroyed, including all the merchandise in the ships, which was all that this man had that made him so rich and worthy of being something in the society. And the door was closed and he sat and he didn't know what to do. He became very, very depressed, confused. He lost his role, he lost his identity. And he became sorrowful and he thought, there's no point in me living anymore. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kill myself, I'm gonna commit suicide. And just before he was about to commit suicide, because everything that he uh, hoped for dependent on was depending on his wealth. So he was entirely attached to his role and his wealth. And suddenly all the wealth was gone and so was the I, which was mistakenly linked with that wealth, also gone right along with the ships. So that means the I is now finished. So there's no point living. And just before he was about to end his life, uh, he was tying the knot uh, for, the, for, the, for the neck and he accidentally hit the ring on his neck and he didn't take note of that. So he put the knot, uh, the knot down and he looked at the ring and it was an interesting ring but as he looked closer he saw a little inscription on the ring and he looked closer and it said even this will pass away. And that was the words by his wise father uh, to remind him that no matter what happens, no matter how joyful or sorrowful life gets or roles we take, even this will pass away. And of course, he, having looked at this inscription, became very hopeful and cheerful and realized my God, so everything is indeed impermanent. Everything, even this sorrow, even this moment of utter grief and utter overwhelm and not knowing what to do and feeling like my life is over, even this will pass away. And as it turned out, with patience, of course, and what we call in Sanskrit, shraddha, which is, um, there's a term for it, we say faith, but shraddha actually means having an open mind that something other than what I perceive or infer, there must be something beyond that. That's called faith. Something other than what I immediately perceive and something other than what I can infer with my mind, there has to be a possibility. And I, as an individual, remain open to that possibility despite it not being immediately available to me right now. That is the definition of faith, Shraddha. So obviously he had some faith, some Shraddha, and he decided to keep his life 
and next morning the um, uh, the uh, uh, they walked into the house and said as it turned out most of your ships have actually uh, detached from the port and they were able to swim away completely safe so they didn't crash into the into the port and they didn't get destroyed and so the man was very relieved and um, it was a obviously a happy story it's not going to end with a suicide it'll be just <laughs> depressing so what we're saying here is this young boy like most of us um, some of us not depends where we're at is we carry certain roles and these roles uh, we, that we carry we accidentally mistaken them for myself, Atman. And this is what causes uh, attachment and constant worry because any moment in life you're expected to do something. Any moment. It seems like every moment in life from moment to moment to moment to moment to moment we're always expected to do something, to make some kind of movement, some kind of gesture, some kind of word, some kind of thought, some kind of uh, occupation, some kind of advice, some kind of uh, resolution, some kind of filling the blanks, whatever it is. And this filling the blanks, whatever it is, is what we call the role. So what we want to now establish is very clear uh, difference between this I and the role that we take on because we are in chapter 5 and we are uh, on the section which is the self is not the door which is um, chapter 5 verse 13 so I really want to uh, make sure that we cover this from many angles okay let's just do a uh, a basic chart here, mind maps. Mind maps give us some good visuals. So the way I want to explain this is, look at it two ways. We have the subject and then we have the, um, the role which the subject plays. So once again, we have the subject, the subject being the person. This basic person is called Purusha. This basic person. Now, when I say basic person, I'm not attributing any special. I'm just saying a general person as you. That includes Atman, it includes Panchakosha, it includes the three bodies, it includes whatever. Just a basic, ordinary human being. That basic person we can call Purusha. And that basic person is always free of the roles which it happens to be taking on in any one moment. At the same time, while that person is free, at the same time, that basic person, Purusha, is relating to the world constantly. In fact, isn't that what life is? Relating. There is no life experience without relating. There is being alive, but that's different from relating. Being alive means sleeping. When there's no experience, that is deep sleep, Prajna Jiva. But there is no interaction with either dream characters, nor is there interaction with the physical, tangible world. So that means in deep sleep, there is prana happening, there is prana going through the body, but there is no experience. Therefore, we say there is no relating. As soon as there is a dream, or even this dream, which is called the waking state, instantly there is relating with an object. There is a basic person, Purusha, relating with something else filling the blanks and this basic person is always in reference to what does this mean this is very important it's going to um, help us with this what and how the roles relate to us in reference to something I am that. I'm going to say that statement again. In reference to something, I am a certain role. In reference to my younger brother, I am an older brother. 
In reference to my older brother, I am a younger brother. So which one am I? Am I younger or am I older? Only in reference to something else. In reference to my children, I am father. In reference to my parents, I am son. So am I father or am I the son? Only in reference to something else. In reference to Chinese, I am ignorant, even though I'm learning Chinese, thanks to Xinyi. In reference to English, I am knowledgeable. So which one am I then? Am I knowledgeable or am I ignorant? Only in reference to that object to which I happen to be relating. What do we say life experience is? Relating. When are you not relating except in your deep sleep? Never. So that means that any one moment of time, there is a relating, the I, basic person Purusha, basic person Atman, free of attributes, is relating to, <coughs> in reference to something else. Thus, only in reference to that is it taking on the attributes or the role of, in this case, the Greek young boy as a, a poor boy, as a rich boy, as a happy boy, as the one that's about to end his life boy. Only in reference to something which the person, basic person, is relating to. In reference to an object which I like, I am a liker. In reference to an object which I dislike, I am a disliker. Isn't that what all of the thumbs up and thumbs down on YouTube and Facebook are? Only in reference to the news or the post feed do we put a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Depending on what? On the person's own vasanas, own conditioning. Based on that, are they able to then decide whether this, which I am relating to, which is called life, am able to generate an opinion of either thumbs up or thumbs down. When I put a thumbs up, in reference to what I put a thumbs up, I become a liker. In reference to thumbs down, I become a disliker. So then what am I? Am I a liker of life or am I a disliker of life? Only in reference to the relative object which happens to be in my immediate vicinity in that time. And so therefore our swadharma, our roles that we play, every moment means in reference to, we're always playing the role of something. The danger is not in playing the role of something. That is not where the danger is. You can play whatever role you wish. There is no law here as long as it coincides with Samanya Dharma. Not injuring, not cheating, not lying, not using uh, scrupulous techniques. As long as that is being in compliance with, there is no issue with what one is to do in life at any one moment in reference to something else. The problem becomes when that which is invariable, the basic person, Atman, takes on a different, just a metaphor, a different hat. So the way we can do this is just a simple image. Imagine that you're just one basic head and that basic head is you. Awareness, pure awareness, Atman. And this basic head, because it is born, and what do we say about life? Living is relating. It has to, by the virtue of its birth, relate with the world in order to not only survive, but also to provide for the society. Because anything born has a function of itself. Every plant has a function of itself. It gives birth to an animal. An animal eats that. It gives birth to, if one eats meat, it gives meat to a human being. Or the animal gives, uh, 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 bur you know, it supports the human being. So everything supports something else. 
the problem comes when this one head takes on a different hat that is the hat of the role and then mistakenly forgets its identity as the ever-present, ever-pure I which is always free of any identity which it happens to be taking on. <coughs> so any moment a new hat is being worn. Right now a hat of maybe a listener is being worn. And then we've got a hat of being a driver. Then we've got a hat of being a father, a hat of being a mother, a hat of being a fa uh, or, or a friend, a hat of checking the news. That's another one. We get what? Stuck in the hat and we form likes for that hat and then refuse to let it go, causing what? Attachment for that hat. And then what happens? We end up pulling the phone again. We put it down and again. We put it on and again. I've seen this, uh, I used to fly quite often to Sydney and it was just very, quite new to me to see when I was sitting next to business people, they were usually, um, you know, you would think that professional, and they are professional, I actually don't know their lives, but it's like, pull out the phone on the airplane, like, you know, check, put it in, five seconds later, pull it out again, poker, nah, not again, poker, check message, nah, Wi-Fi is not on. Pull it out again. Is the Wi-Fi on? No, it's not. Pull it out again. Check bank account. Uh, I was like, this is like, I, I have no words for this. So the, the point is, once this hat gets worn as a business person, as a liker of news, as a liker of uh, catching up with my you know, stock market uh, shares and so on, then we develop a gradual attachment, which in so many sophisticated, subtle ways, permeates in our minds and it est establishes eventually that like which then causes us to have a new lifestyle in accordance with that new hat completely forgetting that original identity which was the fact that I was completely fine without it only a couple of months or years ago but now having taken on that new hat it seems as if my life cannot work without this new hat. So this is how samsara works. Very slowly it creeps in and it always seems like everything is normal. Like what's the problem? It's, it's, it, this is the way life is. But it's so, it's so sneaky. So that means we always have to be alert and aware so that these roles don't uh, end up having themselves on our heads for too long. And how do we do that? We talked about karma yoga. One of the other aspects is chanting. The other aspect is uh, scriptural reading, study, contemplation. You can read a verse from your favorite Bhagavad Gita or Upanishads and then contemplate in the light of what I've read, what does this mean for my life? How do I actually apply this? What does this mean in relation to the world? Being a thinker, a self-inquirer. So that identity is what we call a good hat. That's the kind of hat you want to have. So we're not saying a hat is bad nor good. There is no bad or good. It's only appropriate or inappropriate in reference to something else. If my reference is moksha, then a hat of worldly entanglements is not so appropriate. If my passion is for worldly entanglements, which that kind of person has no issue with, like a musician or an artist or anything that provides a service. See, we can't put anyone down because even if they're wearing a hat called a tenure doctor hat, see, the very person that's, that's thinking will actually one day need that kind of hat, who's a person who's wearing that kind of hat. So once again, there is nothing role, wrong with roles, only that we're always attuned that this role is not identified with the eye. Okay, so what we covered is the basic um, foundation between the role and the eye and having that clear vision between the two and never confusing oneself with it. Otherwise, what happens is then before we know it, an argument is, we're in an argument. Before we know it, we're thinking injurious himsa thoughts about someone or something. It doesn't have to be performed physically, but even thinking about it because after all, everything is Ishwara. When are you not thinking about something that is not created by Ishwara? 
Everything is Ishvara. So that means even a thought, what does a thought usually contain? Let's say a bubble of thought. It contains characters and objects, right? And what are those characters and ob objects? Who made them? Did I make them? Ishvara made it. Orders put together intelligently by five elements. And now I think about those orders saying what? Ishwara is imperfect. So that means we have to catch ourselves because this is part of living a dharmic life of uh, virtues and uh, being you know, in line with the declarations of the Upanishads. All right. So let's put this into a summary. So there is this basic person, the I am, who is the hearer, the seer, the thinker, who is taking on different roles all day long, all life long. And the logic is, I am invariable. Self is invariable, never changes, always aware of the changing phenomena of the pluralistic world. That one unchanging is assuming variable status or variable roles from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. And they have no choice, in fact you have no choice but to play a role. The only time you're not playing a role is when you're sleeping, so you're always playing a role. Now. Even if there is a seeming choice, let's say you say, oh, well, I'm going to choose to have a certain occupation. And then you say, well, I've exercised my free will. Okay. But what happens once you are in the occupancy, once you're working? Is it not true that you're assigned and you've got responsibilities to talk with certain people who have different personalities? That means you're what? automatically as though expected to act and comply in order to relate with that person who one may not like to deal with. We're expected to. Even though we made the role and we said, I want to work in this job, that's where it ends. Because once you're in there, once you're in life, as we are all the, all the time, we're always relating. And the situations which we're relating to do not always coincide with our likes and dislikes, with our vasanas or samskaras. So therefore, our role takes on dynamism. And if it's not dynamic, it's the only other choice being rigid. And if it's rigid, then what happens is there is conflict with the world. And what does conflict with the world do? Causes agitation of the mind. And what does agitation of the mind do? causes the mind to carry those remnants even hours later. And what does those remnants do? Make it very hard to discern between Atman, basic person, Purusha, and the role which ended five hours ago. So that is the importance of constantly being aware that yes, I am taking on this role right now, but once the role is finished, remember one's identity, which is what Arjuna was having trouble with on the field, forgotten his identity as a soldier once he saw his relatives and having forgotten that original purpose and then he what collapsed in sorrow and grief, couldn't attend to the worldly uh, situation, to the worldly um, demands which escalated in, oh, thank God it happened because now we have the Bhagavad Gita. So, you know, there's nothing inappropriate or appropriate. It's always in relation to something else. Okay, coming back to assuming variable status. This status, as I said, the job, for example, let's say you're a woodcutter. To be a woodcutter, you need what? You need to deal with a chainsaw. To deal with a chainsaw, <clears throat> a chainsaw itself consists of many parts. And those parts you did not create. In fact, those parts came from Earth. So that means no matter what occupants you deal with, you're always ultimately dealing with the five elements because everything came from Earth. And Earth, having an intelligence of its own look around you, having been put together, molded, shaped intelligently by Ishwara, and the truth of Ishwara 
is Brahman. So it always goes back to pure consciousness awareness. That means no matter what you're dealing with, including your chainsaw, is also Brahman, is also Ishwara. Okay, and this combination of things in life we call Jagat. That means the world we see now is the product of when Maya is operating in manifests. So you see the line here, Maya, that means it's in between the self and between Mitya. That means it is neither the self, it is not the self, neither is it Jagat. So how, how can we say that if all there is is Brahman? How can I suddenly say that, Mitya, that um, Maya is neither Brahman nor is it the Jagat? Then what is it if the, all there is is Brahman? Think about this. It's a trick question. Potential. Potential, good. If it's a potential, there's nothing to say about it when it's not in manifest because there is nothing to see. There's nothing to experience. That means we don't even know that there is a potential if there is no manifestation called Jagat. When there is a manifestation, which is the byproduct, the effect that you're experiencing right now called Jagat, you can then infer that by the effect, there must be a cause because there is no effect without a cause, is there? And by the cause being Maya, being or Ishwara, if you want to put it, when, when Maya is projecting, there must be a cause of Ishwara. Because you, what, what's the cause of the wave? What's the cause of the wave? Oh, in the in the ocean, the ocean, and what? Okay, and so so we stop at the ocean, do we? No. What causes the ocean? What gives birth? What because of what is the ocean possible? H2O. Oh, H2O. So that means we go right back to a, to that to that Brahman being the both material cause, but also the intelligent cause of the entire world, and through its power called Maya, when it is expressing, we give that name called Ishwara. So that means if we interchange between Maya and Ishwara, there's actually no difference because some Upanishads speak of Maya as Ishwara and also interchangeably use Ishwara as Maya. So from this lesson onwards, when I start using Maya and Ishwara, start to recognize them as the same power, all knowledge, all power. But if we want to get specific, we can also say when all knowledge and all power is expressing, we call that Ishwara. When it is in potential, we call that Maya. But there is always an expression, isn't there? There's always a potential coming. There's always, now it's not here, now it is here. So it's always a potential expressing. Therefore, Maya and Ishwara are actually one. Yeah. Okay. So this scheme within a scheme is what we have. Um, and every scheme is intelligently composed by five elements, which is a effect of its cause being Ishwara and the cause of Ishwara being Brahman. Shinyi, do we want to uh, turn off the heater? It's getting hot here, huh? Okay, now let's apply logic to this. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> avidya. What is avidya? Ignorance. <clears throat> All right. Avidya is not knowing reality. That's just the basics of Avidya. That means whatever is born, it doesn't know the three orders of reality. The, um, the Jiva Srishti, Ishwara Srishti, and the final absolute reality, Paramartika. That is the non-changing reality. So Avidya is not knowing the difference between these three realities, which cause constant conflict in the world. Because I don't know if it's my stuff, or am I projecting onto you, Am I talking about the absolute transactional reality, the reality that we deal with in the world, or am I talking about my reality? 
So having total clarity with this is what we're, what this course is about. Okay, Avidya is not knowing the reality that all is indeed Ishwara and there is no separation between Ishwara or Brahman. Can you separate the jumper from the wall? Impossible. Wherever there is a jumper, that is Ishwara, that's exactly where the wall is. So that means they are ultimately one. Okay, the ocean being the real doer, serving the needs of the total and not just one Vikara. Because if you say, what is Vikara? Modification. See, our idea usually goes like this. Um, Ishwara should provide for me alone. Like, Ishwara, give me, make my life, you know, make my life pleasant. So we pray and we disregard the fact that Ishwara's quote, job, the way Ishwara works is by serving the needs of the total. Not just one Vikara, but all Vikaras, all modifications in the world. So that means it is unreasonable to expect always having your way. Because let's say that um, two people need to get a job. And I think I should get a job. But in actuality, it will be much better according to the needs of the total if the other person gets a job. So therefore, if I do not know that all is Ishwara, then what's going to happen is if I don't get the job, I'm going to then take it on what? Myself or God. Say, God, I prayed and I didn't get the job. How could you? It doesn't work like that. So we need to understand how Ishwara operates according to the needs of the total. If it's not in the highest and greatest good for the total, then it's probably not going to manifest. Okay. So now that there is a Vidya being born, there is identification with just one Vikara. That one Vikara modification is what we call that basic person Purusha Jiva. I am that individual. Okay. Three. I am that Jiva who is a doer with what? The assumption that there is a Vidya, not knowing the fact that who is the actual doer? The entire ocean, serving the needs of the total. So we're still speaking of someone who doesn't know this. So I am, this is what the person who doesn't know is saying, I am that Jiva who is a doer, but actually the ocean is the real doer, whose job is to serve the needs of the total. Thus the consequences are of my doing. And in order to create an a, a environment that suits me, what, what does a person do? That basic person starts to manipulate the environment. Call, uh, I think we call this the, the, the law of attraction overload, where we're trying to you know, pray and uh, trying to visualize. It's all about just getting what I want, basically. In other words, according to my samskaras, according to my vasanas, my tendencies, that is what I want to have happen. And it doesn't always work out. But because this person doesn't know about these three realities, they endlessly strive to create life according to their preferences with constant disappointment, knowing Ishwara is serving the needs of the total, what actually happens over time is the energy gets depleted, trying to serve, trying to change the world, and not having it worked, and then a the person eventually gets discouraged. So that's how important knowing these three realities are, what the truth is. Because it's actually about living, living a smooth, proper life, about knowing this. All right. I, the door, was still at ignorance stage, engages in the world to get maximum results. Isn't that the case per our observation? Silicon Valley, innovating, you know, trying to beat competitors, trying to get the upper hand, uh, trying to get more attention, trying to get more marketing leads, uh, anything that in implies results, potential. So this is still at that stage of avidya. And that I, who is enjoying, what's the enjoyer? the ego, ahamkara, the doer slash enjoyer. Why does this person watch the TV? Watching is a doing, but why is the doing 
being done to enjoy the actions of those results. That's why ego are one in the, the doer and the enjoyer, they are inseparable. There is no such thing as doing for the sake of doing, unless you're, you know, forced. But even then you're forced, why? Not to be hurt. That means at least I am complying, someone's got a gun in my head, I'm complying so that I can enjoy my aliveness later. So I'm still complying, I'm still doing so I can enjoy it later. So you cannot do unless there is a sense of um, what we call the enjoyer. So what does that say about how much effort you put into something when you're trying to achieve something that you enjoy and something you're trying to manipulate? Yeah. At what point do you actually then get the realization that I'm pushing this too hard and too far? What would we say to that? At what point will we know that we're pushing too hard and too fast, despite our enjoyment in the activity? Any answers? If it affects other people. Huh? If it affects other people. Ah, good one. Is it affecting other people's lives in a, in a way that if you were on the receiving end, you would not appreciate it? Uh, is it... <coughs> Is it consuming and causing this balance in other activities in life? Is it maybe causing me to spend less time with family or business? And eventually, uh, the more time we were attached, that hat is so attractive that all the other hats which we need to attend to start to suffer because we're not attending to them. So how do we know? By being very acutely sensitive about life in total and knowing where we stand and what role we play. And if it starts to show any inconsistencies in its level, then by that sensitivity, we can decide, well, this needs to be, you no, know, this needs to be put a stop on this, I need to attend my life. This is called the art of balance, balancing life. So that's recognizing that you've got multiple hats on simultaneously. Oh, I mean, multiple hats. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can. I mean. Yeah. It's, like, you know, it's like the businessman that's fully into a yeah. situation and his wife phones up and yeah. puts demands on him while he's trying to deal with, a, with a, yeah. something else and then trying to reach that balance between yeah. where does his attention go to. Yeah, no, yeah. so there's a, mega, there's a big hat called the business guy, but there's small hats on top of this big hat called uh, you know, employee hat and boss hat and colleague hat. So there's still a management of hats. It's a hat either way. The point is don't get lost in, don't lose your identity with the hat. That's the lesson, yeah. Perform the hat as best your ability as long as it complies with samanya, dharma, it doesn't hurt and it doesn't cause one to get over attached and therefore lose themselves in that. In fact, all of the hats which end up creating uh, destruction in the world is when they are performed without the guidance of dharma. That means I'm going to make money, but I have no sense of, is it hurting someone else? Is it, is it unfairly causing injury for some other family which may not be immediately available to my vicinity? See, it's very, uh, this was a very, uh, I think there was an experiment actually, why it's so much easy to bomb a, a civilian when they're, not, when they're up there, when they're in the sky, because they don't see who they're bombing. Even though they know they're launching the rockets, and, but they don't see the gore and the blood and the limbs they're going to fly around. So it's much easier to do that. But the closer we are to life, the more we are in touch with Dharma, what is good and right. And how do we get close in life? By balance. You know, it goes back to your question. What, is, what needs my attention? Because if I spend too much time in one hat, then I lose <coughs> track of, is my attention, is my time and effort uh, by the society required elsewhere? Yeah, so it's also micromanaging. Okay. That I who is now uh, enjoying from my actions, see why it's my actions? Because that person does not still recognize that the, needs, the, 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 the actions are being served by the needs of the total by Ishwara. So that person believes that the actions are my responsibility. I am the doer. Remember, we're still on a subject, the self is not the doer. So we're now covering what happens when the self thinks it's the door. So that I is uh, enjoying the results from my actions because I am 
small, incomplete, empty. Why do we chase objects? Why do we look for things? Why, what causes an innocent person to be going and pursuing their time, money and effort so much for years and years into something? Yeah. There's a sense of, if I get that, then I will be happy, complete and whole, recognized, I will be having the right status. Of course, this depends on their own conditioning, their own vasanas. And by the fulfillment of that position, that role, which can take years to fulfill, then I will feel complete. And it works, but temporarily. Yeah. And once that role no longer uh, satisfy that completion, then that, then as you know, mitya is changing. So that means no amount of completion felt in any one moment in the mitya world will stay. Why? Because mitya means changing. That means when it's at its peak, when the happiness is at its peak, the virtue of mitya is changing. So it's not going to remain at its peak. It's very common sense. So that means that there's a great... Um, we're not saying don't depend on worldly objects. Just be careful not to get attached to the worldly hat and expect the joy from that because it's going to change. And therefore, the intensity of that's going to change. And when the intensity changes, so does happiness go right along with it. And because now I missed that original peak intensity, I'm going to then go and look for opportunities how to bring that intensity back into the present. So it causes this constant uh, chasing of experiences. This is common in the spiritual world, trying to chase transcendental experiences. You know, feeling God, transcendental, give me more and deeper experiences. It's just recognizing everything is God, so what is there to transcend if everything is already Ishwara? Okay. So this I am who feels small, incomplete, and partial, who in actuality is awareness and isn't the door and is already full, whole, and complete. Question. Why is... Awareness not the door. Someone explain to me. Why is awareness not the door? Because it's just the witness. Okay. More? No attributes. Good. Doesn't change. Huh? Doesn't change. Fantastic. More. Why is why is awareness not a door? Think about it. You can't be aware and do at the same time. Huh? You can't do and be aware at the same time. You can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, see, it is a door and it's not a door at the same time. Because we said the jumper and the wall are never apart. So there is no such thing as saying there's absolutely no door. You have to include both satya and mitya. But at the same time, you have to know which order of reality we're operating in. Just like, I'm going to give you an example. Well, doing applies a start and a finish. And, yeah. And, and, and so obviously, it's, it's yeah, you, you nailed it. Perfect. So that means obviously there was something before that starting. And there's something remains after the ending in order for a new start to begin. So obviously there has to be a gap of something, awareness, to sustain and uphold the segments of time frames, which we call jagat, which we call um, experiences. A very another example to give you is before we go to six and seven. Um, okay, I'm dreaming, and in my dream, I kill my wife. Right, and there's blood on the sheets in the bed, and then I wake up. And then I go to the police station and I said, um, I killed my wife. Oh, oh really? Yeah? And uh, where, where, okay, where is this? It's on my bed. All right, and um, how, can we, how can we locate your wife? Oh, she's in my dream. And the police says, uh, sir, sorry, we can't arrest you uh, for homicide because you killed your wife in the dream. You didn't kill your wife in this world. We can only arrest you if you killed your wife in this world. But you say, yeah, I know that, but I was there. I witnessed the murder. I witnessed the killing. Like, I did it. 
Sir, we know you did it, but you did it in your dream. You didn't do it here. If you did it here, gladly come to the police station. You need to go back to the dream world and get arrested there. So the question is, I was what? Sleeping in bed. And yet that I who was sleeping in bed was simultaneously busy performing an uh, act of murder. So am I a doer or am I not a doer? Only in reference to mitya, called the dream world. <coughs> no different than this world called the waking world is another reference. Why? Because it also has no continuity. It eventually subsides and disappears in deep sleep, just like the dream does also. Therefore, only in reference to is my reality a door. But out of that reference point, I am no more than that dreamer who is ever free of whatever jagat happens to be going on in the dream, despite that dreamer believing and feeling that the murder is being done by me and the characters who are also me, the dreamer, are also being affected and related to by me and the, the sun who is shining and which happened to be laying on the beach is also born out of me because without me, the dreamer, there is no dream. Only in reference to the dream world can we say, I am the doer. Only in reference to the waking world do we say, I am the doer. But the dream world, the waking world, and the deep sleep world are only but changing. Why are they changing? As Martin said, because they begin and end. So, number six. This person now, having a little bit smartened up, or have, have that, let's see, soon realizes they don't get their likes and dislikes satisfied because the ocean is the real door. But they don't know this. But at least they notice that the likes and dislikes are not being satisfied. And the cause of this avidya, remember we started number one, avidya, is the self-esteem uh, starts to become low, uh, frustration, sorrow, grief, no different than Arjuna happened to be the same when he lost his identity at Kurukshetra, looking upon his two uh, teachers, Drona and Grandsire, Bhishma. And there is sadness, despair, and smallness. And this then escalates into uh, just different psychological problems. And there is no greater distance between such a situation and seeking for the truth. So that is the importance of being alert and aware and having sadhana next to us all the time reminded about what our identity is, not on the, on the absolute, but also being clear what is my role at every one moment. All right, we're gonna, assume, we're gonna do an exercise soon. <clears throat> The self is not a doer. Chapter 5, verse 13. The self doesn't create a sense of doership. So self is a satya. That's what I'm talking about. Satya. Satyam. The self doesn't create a sense of doership. Why? Because self is pure awareness. It's just, it's attributeless. It has no attributes. It's just aware of what? The experiences generated by Maya. And those experiences with avidya, what happens, not knowing the three realities, is the person superimposes I over the experience that is being orchestrated in the moment and then that I loses itself in that experience as the role which needs to be uh, attending to that experience. So the self doesn't create a sense of doership. Okay. 
So Maya does believe, yeah. Okay, what it's saying here is this Maya generates this belief that we call, this inherent belief that we have, I am this body, mind, uh, intellect, this BMI. And, uh, which is fine, we're not saying you're not supposed to feel like it. This is very important because sometimes we think that a Jivan Muktaha is someone who experiences something other than what a normal person does. That's untrue. It's completely the same. Just the understanding is the same. So, this belief is um, by being born, I am the body. Why is that the belief? Why is that inherent belief? Because whatever is born is the self, that basic person, Purusha, Atman, automatically gaining what? Three bodies or the five sheets. And because it is automatic, it's provided by Maya, then due to avidya, not knowing the three realities, Jiva, Srishti, Ishwara, Srishti, and Paramarthika, the absolute unchanging reality, there is an instantaneous assumption that what I am, what I see, what I experience, I must be. Therefore, I am my body, my mind, and my thoughts. So it's, I said from the first lesson, it's nobody's fault. Anything born automatically is ignorance. It doesn't know its nature. That's why we need the Upanishads, the scriptures, to, re to help us recognize what is the truth. So we can be in line with that truth and not confuse our thinking, which causes suffering, overwhelm, and all of the other things we've seen. Okay. Okay, so a wise person uh, eliminates the door. How do they eliminate the door? Because the door is the ego. Am I now saying terminate the ego? Because that's going to happen when you die, by the way. I'm not saying that. So how does a wise person, quote, eliminate the door? How? By identifying the self. By re changing your focus from, yes, there is a doing, there is a talking, there is a listening, but that listening, talking, speaking is... Maya creation is the three sheet uh, is the five sheets the panchakosha or the three bodies operating by the virtue of a human being being a subtle body having certain function having limbs and it has to operate in the world in order to relate with life so a wise person also relates with life but does not confuse or is knowing all the unceasingly that there is a body moving, there is a mind thinking, there is a intellect calculating, judging, assessing, discerning, but that is all a function of what? Endless play of, you know, this beautiful, uh, my teacher calls it beautiful uh, ignorance, beautiful eternal ignorance, um, Maya, or, or Ishwara. That means not confusing uh, the fact that there is always a person, there is always a basic, ordinary human being, but despite that, there is that unchanging reality. Now, some of us are going to say this, or maybe not. How do I know there is an unchanging? Prove it to me. If you, now I don't know if you're already aware of that. That actually doesn't matter. But we're going to use simple logic to say this, because Atman is unchanging. Okay. Can you report a changing object if in relation to another changing object? Can you truly tell if an object is moving or not, or its condition, if you are in another moving object? Let's say there's two, no. No, so if there's two trains going, right? Different speed. <laughs> then can I successfully report the true condition of the moving train? Well, I can't because I'm also moving. That means I have to be still in order to report the true velocity, the true condition of that which I happen to be observing. So that means only from the reference point of the still trees, the still environment on the outside, at least looking through the train window, can I report successfully that the train is moving. Only from the standpoint of the fixed sun, non-moving, metaphorical sun, 
can I report and say that the earth is moving? If there is no fixed sun, I can't even say that the earth is moving, let alone if you take out the other planets. So only in relation to something that is completely still, fixed, unchanging, unmoving, can I successfully report accurately that there is indeed a moving, changing experience. Are we aware of our changing experiences? Huh? Yeah, look at this. The hand just moved. Nobody can deny that. Why is that? Because there's a part of us inherent called Brahman in hearing in all jivas because of which we can successfully report our experiences consistently, never-endingly, unceasingly because of this unchanging principle Atman. Including our thoughts. How many times does a thought go in and out of your mind in a day or last? We're totally aware of that, aren't we? And emotions. How many times do emotions pop up in and out? You're totally aware of that. How? Only in relation to something which you in here called Atman, which by the virtue of our logic has to be fixed, non-moving, unchanging, invariable. It's just pure logic. You can't report a changing experience unless there is a still reference point in order to report a changing experience. Okay. The self doesn't create uh, a sense of doership, nor is it directly or indirectly responsible for the results of your actions. All right. What we're speaking of here is there's a doubt. Let's go back to that murder. <laughs> and we're going to say, all right, if Brahman is the cause, the material cause, and the intelligent cause through its power of Maya, if, Ma if Brahman is the final reality, the final existence, and everything that we experience in this world is of that final reality, does that not then indirectly attribute Brahman to all of the murders that happen on, in the world? It seems like that, doesn't it? That means there's an indirect correlation between evil, apparent evil that happens here, and Brahman. Because if everything comes from consciousness, and we see a bunch of evil things going on here, then the logic now comes, well, then consciousness must be evil. But the Upanishads say that's not true. Because whatever, whatever happens in the order of Mitya is completely apart from Satya. There has no, there is no connection, zero. So how do we prove this? Well, we did it earlier with the dream. It absolutely feels real. In fact, the good dreamer, a good Samaritan, has all the good intentions, and yet they go to sleep, and suddenly this cruel world that has no relation to the, to the dreamer starts to, to arise. And the dreamer's like, what on earth is going on? Like, this is not, this is not, this is not me. Like, this, I, wouldn't, I would never do this. But it's like when you're in an emotional state, you've, thought, you've had a thought, which, is, which has created an emotion within you, which then gives you a basis of that emotion to, to arrive at your next thought. So you, you remit you the whole time. It's just it's relative to the relating thing you're talking about. You're always relating to the, to the mitya side. You're always relating to the mitya side. And because why? Because if you take the ocean, it is endless series and causes which are beyond the human mind to come. Because let's say there's a big, big ocean, right? A big, not an ocean, a big wave. And the wave seems like very dangerous, right? It's gonna like crumble, and it's gonna like consume all the other waves. But what we don't realize, because our limited thinking, is that right on the other side of the world, there were certain causes and effects, let's say currents, that over time caused these different currents to travel 6,000 kilometers across the world and then on the other side of the world cause this huge wave and then we what? Attribute evil to this wave. But it was attributed by what? Endless series of causes and effects which is far beyond our perception or inference. Thus, going back to Shraddha, there must be something here other than what I perceive or infer. That is faith. And that faith needs to be applied to this scripture for it to work. But isn't there a huge difference between <coughs> dream and 
we call this a real world, a living world. Mm. Uh, a dream, like you have a dream, like you murder your wife in the dream. Yeah. Like when you wake up, that dream is not going to repeat again. I mean, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. But in real life, let's say a murder takes place, and next morning you continue with the investigation and you carry on and you carry on yeah. and you finish all the It's a continuation of life. Yeah. There is no stopping. Like today you meet someone, you, you can continue meeting them forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a dream, you do not meet the same person you see in the dream. Yeah, okay. Next moment is gone. And then yeah. you never see the person again. No, absolutely. The so there is a lot of difference there. So there what is, is reality? What is unreality? What is it? What's the consequence? What is a waking up? In the dream, it's only you. In the dream, in the dream only, yes. everything the, is the, you. The, it's from but in, your in the awakened life, the consequences from that action goes beyond you. No, but we were saying it's all a, it's an all a waking and a changing state. Yeah. That I see the continuity different in the real state and the continuity very different in a dream state. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, fine because seeing the dream state, what's the reason the dream is so fluid is because there's no five organs of, um, there's no physical body. That's why we can bend and fly and do whatever we want in a dream. And because of that, there is no. Um, um, there is no stability. So everything, there is no sense of continuity. That's why everything's changing. So all we're speaking of now is just a, a, a general dynamic of the dream. But despite the dream or this waking state, despite there is consistency in the waking state, it actually, it's actually the same thing because if you look at it from a, um, from a point of view of a waking state has a beginning, it has an end. And then the dream has a beginning, has an end. And then the deep sleep has a beginning and an end. So that means none of these states, these three states, last. So that means even the three states that we experience, including right now, the waking, are not real. They're only real while they're real. But where is, where is this world while you're in deep sleep? See, what real means is it, it never ends. It's unceasing. It's always present never not present. In other words, it's always known. And how is it that you, they're able to know about this waking state that we're in now? You, you certainly know about your dream state. And I know you're going to say there's nothing in my deep sleep. But I'm going to ask you, do you sleep? Now, when I say, when you said, do you sleep? And I, you said yes, were you referring to your dream or sleeping? The dream and sleep. Yeah. Because when I wake up, I still feel I slept, but yeah. I had a dream. Yeah. See, the thing is, we still know about when we say sleep. Because when I ask you, uh, are you, are, did, you, did, you when I, did you go to sleep, did you have a good sleep? You don't, and you say yes to me, you're not saying, yeah, I had a good dream. You're not referring to a dream, are you? Sleep. You're referring to something other than the dream. So that means there is, and the point is you still know that there is a sleep. So that means you know about the waking state, you certainly know about the dream state, and despite not having any experience in the deep sleep, we still are aware that there is, a, there is a sleep state. So that means that one principle, which when we get to Madhyuka Upanishad, we'll talk about, it's called Turiya. And that Turiya is that unchanging principle which permeates all the three states generated by what? Maya. And the Jiva constantly undergoes through these three experiences. Vishwa, uh, we got Prajna, Taijasa, you know, the three jivas. So that means even the three, even this state right now is false. Why is it false? Because it doesn't last. Yeah. So a wise person still experiences all the three states, except they know through knowledge that nothing that lasts, not, nothing that has a beginning and an end is by that virtue of having a, um, a beginning and an end is not real. Because what is real has to be always present, consistent. Absolutely. Yeah. So going back to uh, what we were describing, yes, there is the dynamic of the dream and there's the dynamic of the uh, waking state. I was just using that as an example to demonstrate um, how the, on the microcosmic level, on the jiva level, we have a dream. But it is exactly the same on a macrocosmic level. In fact, on the Sunday class, we're now actually going through a very good... Um, how Brahman, being the material cause, an intelligent cause, desires and visualizes the entire universe through its power of Maya. Yeah. So, and that's exactly what a human being does. We desire and then we visualize the world and we manifest that world that is called our world, like my house, you know, my family, my this, my that. So it's exactly the same on a micro and a macrocosmic scale. 
All right. <clears throat> so the self is not responsible directly uh, because the self is just awareness. It has no arms and limbs of itself. It needs its power called Maya to project the world. Just like when you go to sleep, once again, do you instigate the dream consciously? Whether you like it or not, the dream appears totally out of your control. It's exactly the same on a macrocosmic scale. Brahman, all awareness, all consciousness, through its power called Maya, suddenly this whole world manifests, which we call Jagat. Completely unasked for, not, not unprovoked. In other words, it just, poof, instant. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the Sunday class because it gets now into the nitty-gritty details. Nor is it indirectly responsible because why, just like with the uh, dream example once again, there's this Mitya world and there is a Satya world and there is no correlation between the two. So whatever ever happens in the ocean, is the water responsible? No. Because H2O is completely innocent. It's just there giving the power for the ocean to be, giving the power for the wave to be. The ocean is an endless series of causes and effects of itself. But whatever happens, however high the waves are, whatever they're fighting and, and doing, whatever they, the water is completely innocent to it. It's just providing its, 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 its existence itself. So it's only because of the self can this power called Maya uh, be uh, creating this world called Jagat. Okay. Let's let me see here. All right. The idea that you are incomplete and inadequate causes doership and willful action. Remember that mind map? Incomplete, not full. The idea that we are incomplete, inadequate causes doership and willful action. Why? Because if I don't know the truth, that I am already full, whole and complete, Atman, then what's going to happen? And I associate the I identity with the Jiva, which is always asking, it's always hungry, it's always looking for desires, it's always wanting to get more, it's trying to satisfy its cravings for the mental, intellectual uh, certificates, uh, you know, feel good emotionally, have exercised the body. That's what the jiva is. That's what it's constantly asking for. So if the I is linked into that jiva, which is by, just by its birth, has to survive, then there's going to be constant inadequacy and constant strife for completion or getting rid of that feeling of incompletion. No different than when a mosquito bites you. What do you do instantly when a mosquito bites you? <laughs> Let's say you don't see that, right? <coughs> Right? There's a scratch. Now, what do we want to do with that scratch? We want to get rid of it. Don't we? And to get rid of it, I mean, just, just stick with getting rid of it. Why do we want to get rid of it? Because we know it doesn't belong to us. And what do we do when we get rid of it? Our minds get agitated and we have a need to participate in worldly entanglements in order to what? Scratch this desire so I can temporarily relieve myself of it at least temporarily, it feels good. But the more you scratch, the more that itch starts to grow and wants to be scratched even more. That is why it's so hard to uh, manage this world because everything's so attractive here. How does that go with hunger and food? Oh, there's a certain Ishwara Srishti world. Ishwara Srishti is the trees you see, the uh, language we speak, the body movements. That is uh, provided on the universal scale. And that's always going to be um, natural. But when Jiva Srishti comes in, that's what we call having a craving or an over craving for eating, like a lot of ice cream or cake. So we can always superimpose Jiva Srishti onto Ishwara Srishti and make our hunger the most important thing of our lives. <sighs> so that's why I say these three realities is what life is, managing them, otherwise we get confused. We go, well, I like money, you know, I like to be rich, I like to eat, I like to this, I like to that, but it's actually unnatural because it's actually fueled by our tendencies, our vasanas. All right, let's do an exercise. We're going to continue this uh, next year. 
The cell of his nephew to good and bad. All right, it's, it's, it's a long section, good. Okay, what I would like us to do now, let me see where we are. So this next year, we continue on January the 8th. Now, we're going to have a group discussion. You're going to get into a group, and you're going to talk about every single one of these points. Whatever your knowledge is about the purpose of the Gita, how to communicate, remember session 2 or 3, we did uh, Satyam Vadam, Rutam Vadam, Priyam Vadam, Hitam Vadam. We're going to do Saro, the Saro body, the Manas Buddhi Ahamkara, that's the ego. Causal body, that's the Sanchita Prarabdha Agami, that's the, uh, you can read the, the definitions here. Dharma, we've got Samanya Dharma, universal Swadharma um, is unique to the person. Uh, explain the concept of free will. Tie that in with 4A because we talked about how these uh, karmas play uh, entwine with free will. What are some attributes of a Jivan Muktaha, a liberated person? And general, what is the purpose of Dvaita Vedanta? Examples, term, how it helped you. And who am I not? Use all Vedanta knowledge to describe what the I is not. The key to moksha is not, as that, that one of my uh, Nima's teacher said, is not knowing who you are as so much is it knowing who you are not. Because it's easy to know I'm unchanging. But because it's so entwined with the changing, we have to know what's the changing first. Okay, so uh, group, group, group. So we've got three groups. That group, this group, and this group. Uh, turn around and discuss every one of these points. Everyone gets to share something. Just to, so the, the whole point of this is to see how much you know. It's got nothing to do with right or wrong. Now the fun part. This is uh, yay work for January 15th, not, next, not the first week when we meet next year, which will be the 8th of January, but after the first week we meet will be the 15th of January. Um, our assignment is, this is not for anyone other than yourself, so this is not, don't look at this as some kind of project that has to be done. This is just for you. Uh, what does it mean to live a life of Dharma? So that means your, your job here is to use all of the research you have, it's good to take pictures of this, um, and write out what does it mean to be a human being that... Uh, it lives according to what is right, what is dharmic, what is non-injurious to the society for both yourself and your family and the world and everything else. And the second is, what is the difference between satya and mitya? And how is this knowledge between satya and mitya applied in day-to-day -day ordinary life of duties, joys, sorrows, concerns, doubts, and epiphanies. So, what I'm asking you here is, is a one-page report. And this is going to be something that you do for yourself, and it's practical. So, let's make it practical. No, no, no need for theory. Uh, it doesn't actually do much. It was just provide personal examples with your you know, those, your children, your uh, friends, your life situation. How would you answer these two questions? Um, and what we're going to do is we have two choices. I would like to hear, actually, anyone would like to hear this. Um, so you have two choices. You can either read it, right, from wherever you're sitting on the January the 15th. You can just, like, sit wherever you're sitting now and just read it off to the rest of the class. Or if you're, if you're up for it, um, you can present it. So you can um, give me the PDF, uh, the Word document, you can type it up, and you can put some pictures in that Word document, and I'll just put it here on the iPad, and um, you can take the iPad uh, where you're sitting, and you can just sort of talk from wherever you're sitting, and guide us through your answer in the presentation mode. Yeah, so just look at this as an um, educational uh, activity. It's, it's to educate the rest of us because we all want to actually hear about your, uh, your, your, you know, because everyone has something to share, right? Um, and it's also going to show us, uh, it's also about building confidence, right? And to present it, it it's actually, there's another level, level there to present it. 
uh, it, it requires a little bit of thought and question, how can I help? How can I contribute? So this will keep you busy. Um, a one-page rapport. Do the best you can. And it's not for anyone. There's no right or wrong. It's for you. And to present it, the simple attitude is, how can I be of service? Right? That takes the, you know, the whole um, tension off from presenting. Just like, how can I be of service to the class instead of, how can I make this about me? Yeah, so that's how we sort of deal with that. Okay, any questions so far about the assignment? Are we able to do this together? Or Absolutely. Yeah? yeah, you can do a joint, a joint work and you can all um, come together and uh, you can, someone's going to be a spokesman, of course, and share it. Yeah. One page. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha Sarve santu niramaya Sarve bhadrani pashyantu Ma kashchi dukha bhag bhavet Om Shanti 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 Hi. May all be happy. May all be free from illness. May all behold good things. May no one suffer. Peace. This is individual. There's also, see, that's a good question. Is there such a thing as a collective? There is, because, see, we only talk about so far about the microcosmic jiva. But Ishwara also has, Ishwara means causal body, because um, Prajna is causal body for <coughs> Jiva, but Ishwara is causal body for the macrocosmic. Just like Hiranya Garpa is the subtle body for the macrocosmic, and Virat is the uh, macrocosmic total of physical bodies. That means everything you see around you here is Virat. We're now touching Virat, we're dealing with matter is Virat, everything is Virat. Right into the universe. To the virat is the physical universe, five elements of Virat. <coughs> and Ishwara also has a macrocosmic body, a subtle body called Hiranyagarpa, and that is the total of all of the small uh, microcosmic individuals that are contained, uh, that are of Ishwara. So there's this macrocosmic and microcosmic. So that means that, yes, uh, Ishwara also has uh, Sanchita Prarata and Yagami, but it's on the macro, it's for everyone. But now when an individual is born, a jiva, then there is a Sanchita sign just to that one jiva. So, you, you know, I, I don't know how much you know about Hindu culture, right? They say there's seven lifetimes, there's seven birth. Cat? <laughs> seven birth you take. Yeah. Each human being, in like we have the yoga and different different yoga. So we take seven births to evolve, to get through this vasanas and all. Oh Is my goodness. Anything? I've heard, um, uh, uh, et no, see, it's eternal. Eternal because we don't know. First of all, how, how, am, I supposed to, <laughs> how am I supposed to count? Um, it only ends when one recognizes that I am self, I am unchanging. That's when all of the, however many uh, rebirths were as a result of not knowing this knowledge, because avidya, remember avidya? Yeah. Avidya it what, is what gives birth to the cause, it's what sustains the causal body. And what is avidya? Ignorance. That means not having knowledge, who am I, who and what am I? That means as long as I don't know who and what am I, that I am this body, you know, I am this emotions, avidya continues. So that means upon, upon death, that avidya still is, it precedes the causal body and thus it gives birth to a causal body. And the causal body, what is the causal body? That body which causes the uh, subtle body because of its vasanas. Because you can't express vasanas unless you need, you need a physical form. You can't express desires and there's, there's an equipment to express desires. That's why there's a new birth, because the causal body stays. And there's no place for those tendencies, vasanas, to go unless there is a new physical body. So, so the answer is, uh, there's, it's, an eternal, it's an eternal creation. It stops for the individual, which we call Jivan Mukta, when this avidya is destroyed. How? by uh, contemplating on what it means to say I am unchanging and what is it about me 
that is unchanging until it's so clear, so permanent that it's it's not even. And that's where the vasanas dissolve. They, they well, there's important. certain vasanas that stay. They, they don't need to dissolve from that point because we will never dissolve all our vasanas. This is the important point. There, there needs to be a sufficient uh, dis uh, dissolvement. But all of them, that's impossible. Because the, you're always dealing with the world. You're always relating. And every time you relate, you develop a new tendency, right, to relate again. So that means once the person recognizes the unchanging nature of the I, it doesn't matter how many desires of asanas come, because it's known not be, it's the anatma, it's not I. You're not attached. Yeah, yeah. yeah it has no bearing, it has no attachment. And it's known to be not I. So therefore... Uh, what, the, that avidya is destroyed, so therefore we cannot give birth to another body.